Welcome back to the playlist on amino acid catabolism. And in this video, I pretty much have everything written out here, so I'm just going to go through the explanations to everything. Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about the catabolic pathway for leucine. And we're going to see that it's actually very different from valine, which we saw in the previous video. Okay, when we, uh, cat when we catabolized valine, we ultimately got it down to propionyl CoA, and we ended up converting that to succinyl CoA. What we're going to find out in this video is we're actually going to catabolize leucine down to HMG CoA. And if that if that molecule doesn't sound familiar, certainly go back and watch the ketone body biosynthesis and ketone body catabolism playlist. And if you if you've seen lipid biosynthesis, specifically cholesterol biosynthesis, you might know what HMG CoA is. If you haven't seen any of those things, this probably will be foreign to you. So just bear with me. Okay, so we're going to start with leucine, and just like in the case of valine, we're going to start with the two same enzymes. We're going to start with branch chain transaminase and branch chain alpha ketoacid dehydrogenase complex. And in fact, what we'll find is we'll do the same thing in isoleucine catabolism as well. Okay, so notice that on notice on on our leucine, we have our alpha amine, right? And remember, it pains me to say this, but you can effectively think of uh, transaminase reactions as substitutions between amines and carbonyls. So that amine, that alpha amine, is going to end up as this alpha amine on glutamate, right? But in order to do the transamination, we have to use this molecule, which is alpha ketoglutarate. And again, it's a pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzyme, just like all transaminases are, okay? And by the way, one other thing that's important to realize is the delta, I didn't mention this in the last video, the delta G of transaminase reactions is around zero. So these reactions are reversible, but depending on which of these these molecules you load the system up with, whether it's leucine or 4-methyl-2-ketopentanoate, you can force the reaction to go either direction, right? Right, because the delta G is around zero, so it's really just subject to Le Chatelier's principle. There's not like a, a direction that it really favors because the delta G is close to zero. So if you're loading the system up with leucine, that's going to force this reaction to go towards 4-methyl-2-ketopentanoate. But also if the dehydrogenase complex, which is this right here, if the dehydrogenase complex is consuming 4-methyl-2-ketopentanoate, then you're taking the product, at least in the direction that that it's written out of the system, and that's going to force the reaction to make more 4-methyl-2-ketopentanoate. So in general, um, if you eat a high-protein diet, number one, you're loading your system up with leucine. But also, if you are doing processes by which you're degrading proteins down to amino acids, you're also increasing the concentration of leucine, so this reaction is going to go in the direction that it's written. Okay, so we have 4-methyl-2-ketopentanoate, and that's going to get consumed by the branch chain alpha ketoacid dehydrogenase complex. And I didn't mention this in the other video, but remember, it's a branch chain alpha ketoacid, number one, because here's the alpha ketone group on the acid, and again, we have a branch chain right here, okay? And again, mechanistically, this enzyme is identical to that of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, alpha ketoadipate dehydrogenase complex. All of those enzymes that we've seen are mechanistically identical. So enzyme one, which in this case is going to be alpha ketoacid dehydrogenase or alpha ketoacid uh, decarboxylase, is going to use thiamine pyrophosphate to decarboxylate. And then enzyme 2, which is dihydrolipoyl transacetylase, is going to use lipoate in order to synthesize our isovaleryl SCOA. And that's this molecule right here, isovaleryl SCOA. And then to regenerate the resting state of the enzyme, we're going to use dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase, and we're going to generate an NADH. So again, just like in the last video, we're going to keep track of our yield. Okay, so now we have isovaleryl SCOA, and we're going to dehydrogenate it. And it's going to be an FAD-dependent oxidation, and specifically, we're going to oxidize this bond right here up to an alkene. Okay, and the electrons initially are going to pass into FAD to make FADH2, the reduced form, 
form, but those electrons are ultimately going to tra be transferred to something called an electron transferring flavoprotein. Okay, and this is an important thing about um, these type of FAD dependent oxidations. And I didn't mention this in the last video, but it does play a role. The FADH2 electrons get transferred to something called electron transferring flavoprotein. And this is in the mitochondria, okay? And it, it starts off in the oxidized form, but when it picks up the electrons from FADH2, FAD is regenerated and you end up with the electron transferring flavoprotein in the reduced form. Okay. Now, something else is going to happen to electron transferring flavoprotein. Okay. It's going to be reoxidized back into its oxidized form, but in the process, the electrons are going to be accepted by an enzyme, and that enzyme is called electron transferring flavoprotein ubiquinone oxidoreductase. Right? And that's specifically going to be in the oxidized form, and it's going to pick up the electrons and be reduced into electron transferring flavoprotein ubiquinone oxidoreductase in the reduced form and then those electrons those electrons are going to go into and i'll do this in a different color are go, going to go into coenzyme q which starts out in the oxidized state but then it gets reduced to ubiquinol which is coenzyme q in the reduced state okay and then that coenzyme q is ultimately going to fuel complex three of the mitochondria which we said was cyto, excuse me which is cytochrome c ubiquinol oxidoreductase or complex three right and so ultimately what we get by dehydrogenating isovaleryl CoA is we're going to get one reduced coenzyme Q. And of course, that's going to feed complex three for the uh, pumping of four protons into the intermembrane space. And also keep in mind, NADH is going to fuel NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase or complex one. And that's also going to pump four protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space. So we've already gotten a good deal of energy in the form of a proton gradient. So now we have this molecule and this is 3-methylcrotonyl SCOA. Okay. 3-methylcrotonyl SCOA is going to be carboxylated in a biotin-dependent reaction. And if you need to see the biotin-dependent carboxylation mechanism, certainly go back to the video and watch that. But we're specifically going to carboxylate this carbon right here. And so obviously it's going to be an ATP-dependent reaction because it's a biotin-dependent carboxylase. And the carbon donor... The carbon donor, and that's this carbon right here, is going to come from bicarbonate. So all biotin ATP dependent carboxylase is used bicarbonate as the carbon donor. Okay, and that's going to generate this guy, which is 3-methylglutaconyl SCOA. Okay, now what we're going to do in this reaction is we're going to hydrate this double bond, okay, this alkene, and specifically the carbon that we're hydrating is going to be the one that I'm highlighting in green. That's this one right here. This is going to be the carbon we hydrate. And so the next enzyme, the next enzyme is going to be 3 methylglutaconyl SCOA hydratase. 3 methylglutaconyl SCOA hydratase. And when we do that, that's going to give us this. And this is going to be hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A. And specifically, this carbon right here we need to know is the S isomer. Now, HMG CoA has multiple routes that it can go through. Um, if you're in a time in which you're doing anabolic processes, um, that's not going to be a time when you're doing amino acid catabolism. Whenever insulin's present, whenever insulin's present, that's generally when you do cholesterol biosynthesis. Okay. When glucagon is present, that's when you're doing this process. So glucagon, in part, stimulates amino acid catabolism. So when glucagon's present, when blood sugar's low, you'll be doing this process. So whenever HMG CoA builds up and you've got glucagon present, in other words, your blood sugar is low, you're not running on glycolysis, you're running on amino acid catabolism. HMG-CoA is going to react with an enzyme called hydroxymethylglutaryl-CoA lyase, okay? And the lyase is going to give you these two products right here. You should recognize this molecule as acetyl-CoA, right? This is acetyl-CoA, right? And it's also going to give you this molecule, which is aceto, acetoacetate, okay? Now we have acetyl-CoA and we know what happens to that. Let's account for let's account for one TCA cycle of acetyl-CoA. Well, if we account for one cycle, what do we get? 
where we get three NADHs per TCA cycle. So we get three NADH. We're going to get one FADH2, but really that translates to what? It translates to one, one CoQ in the reduced state, right? Because remember that that FADH2 that's generated by succinate dehydrogenase, remember that that's going to transfer its electrons through a series of iron sulfur centers and then ul ultimately to ubiquinone, reducing it to ubiquinol, right? And then as we know, the NADH fuels ubiquinone excuse me, NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase, or complex one, for the pumping of four protons. And then coenzyme Q in the reduced state, or ubiquinol, fuels complex three, cytochrome C ubiquinol oxidoreductase. Also keep in mind that for one cycle of the TCA cycle, we're going to get one nucleoside triphosphate where the nitrogenous base is either guanine or adenine. And so that accounts for GTP or ATP. And the reason that succinyl-CoA synthetase can do that is because it can react with either ADP or GDP. Okay? And basically, in terms of energy-yielding molecules, that's our yield per acetyl-CoA. But remember also that of what we can do with acetoacetate. Acetoacetate can react with 3-keto-acyl-CoA transferase. 3 keto acyl coa transferase and in this reaction you're going to use succinyl coa which is shown right here this is succinyl this is succinyl coa it's going to use succinyl coa as the coenzyme a donor and you're going to end up with something called aceto acetyl coa so this molecule right here this is aceto acetyl coa aceto acetyl coa and in the process we generate this this is succinate. This is succinate, okay? So what is our yield per succinate? Well, succinate's going to go back into the TCA cycle and react with succinate dehydrogenase, right? It's going to react with succinate dehydrogenase, and that's going to give you FADH2, but as we just said up here, right, as we just said here, the FADH2 is going to equate to one coenzyme Q in the reduced state. So we'll say CoQ in the reduced state, and of course, that fuels complex three of the mitochondria. Okay, and then that gives you uh, fumarate. And then fumarate reacts with fumarate hydratase to give you L-malate. And then L-malate reacts with L-malate dehydrogenase to give you an NADH. So, of course, we're just accounting for um, the cycle up until the production of oxaloacetate, or we could say up until citrate synthase. Okay. So now we have acetoacetyl-CoA. This is going to react with thiolase. Okay, so this terminal enzyme right here, this is thiolase. And thiolase is basically going to split acetoacetyl-CoA into two acetyl-CoAs. So here are two acetyl-CoAs. So let's see what our overall yield is for this reaction sequence. Let's see what the yield is. Okay, so if we go back to the beginning, okay, well, we got a glutamate, but that doesn't really account for a whole lot. We know that the glutamate could be degraded to alpha-ketoglutarate by glutamate dehydrogenase, but we won't consider that here. What we will consider, though, is we got an NADH. We got one NADH from the alpha-keto acid, from the branch chain alpha-keto acid dehydrogenase complex. So we got one NADH there, right? One NADH there. Uh, let's see what else we did. We also, let's see, we got NADH there, let's see, and then we got three acetyl-CoA's, right? We got three acetyl-CoA's, and so remember that if there's three acetyl-CoA's, that means that's a total of nine NADH's, so adding on to the one before, that's 10, right? That's 10, and then keep in mind that when we get succinate back, that's another one, so in total, in this complete catabolism, that's 11 NADHs. That's quite a bit. That's quite a bit. Okay. And then let's go back and see if we can figure out our CoQs, right, or reduce CoQs. Well, our first CoQ was generated by isovaleryl CoA dehydrogenase, right? Isovaleryl CoA dehydrogenase. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but this enzyme right here, this is isovaleryl CoA dehydrogenase, and that gave us one CoQ, right? FADH2 that was generated through the dehydrogenation is going to transfer its electrons to electron transferring flavor protein, which will transfer the electrons to electron transferring flavor protein, ubiquinone oxidoreductase, which will then transfer the electrons to ubiquinone, reducing it to ubiquinol. So there's one right there, right? There's one. And then we got another one 
from the TCA cycle from one acetyl CoA, but remember that there were three acetyl CoAs, right? So there's three acetyl CoAs, so three coenzyme Qs from acetyl CoAs, and one from the pathway before, so that's four, right? That's four, right? And then there was another one from succinate, so that's a total, if, I, if I'm counting right, that's five CoQs in the reduced state, okay? And then let's also think about um, nucleoside triphosphates. Well, whenever we did the biotin-dependent carboxylase, right, where was that? Right here, we had to waste an ATP, right? But whenever we put, um, whenever we do the, whenever we degrade to acetyl-CoA, right, we end up getting one nucleoside triphosphate per acetyl-CoA, and there were three acetyl-CoAs, right? So there would have been three acetyl CoAs produced, and one was consumed. One was consumed by 3-methylcrotonyl S CoA carboxylase. So that means there's a net of two. Let me make sure. Make sure. Yeah, there's a net. There should be a net. There should be a net of two nucleoside triphosphates, and in general. They're going to be two ATPs. Okay, so really, leucine catabolism is a fairly energetically, uh, a very high energetically producing process. You're going to get a lot of energy by catabolizing leucine. Okay, so it would benefit you to definitely know this pathway and to also be able to predict the products, which in this case, if we catabolize it all the way down to acetyl-CoA, if I counted right, it's 11 NADH, 5, five ubiquinols, and 2 net ATPs. If you find a mistake in this video, please comment below, but I think that should be right. I hope this video helped you with leucine catabolism. In the next one, we'll do isoleucine. See you in the next video.